Hey there, this is Mr. Wells. In today's astronomy lecture video, we're going to be talking about what are the causes of seasons on the Earth. Okay, so this is kind of a tricky one because a lot of people think that seasons are caused by the distance to the sun. Now, this actually makes conceptually a lot of sense, right? So the sun is a giant thermonuclear fireball, 93 million miles, 150 kilometers from the Earth. Seems like it's a pretty far away away, but we know that that's actually one of our closest neighbors in the solar system. So you have this giant fireball, and the closer that you get to it, it kind of makes sense conceptually. It may definitely make sense conceptually that the closer you are to the sun, the hotter it's going to be. Uh, this is something that I would believe that most people think, actually. In fact, I'm about to show you a video that shows a few Harvard graduates being interviewed during their graduation ceremony. And uh, let's just see what they have to say. Okay, I think the seasons happen because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather. And, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun. And, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun and it gets colder when we get farther away from the sun. All right, thank you, Harvard graduates. So before we settle this case of uh, whether or not it's the distance to the sun that actually causes seasons, there is one more figure I would like us to look at. And we have to know that the Earth's orbit is actually an ellipse. So it is definitely true that there are times of the year where we're going to be closer to the sun on the Earth, and there are times of the year where we're going to be further away. And so the way that this works actually is that at perihelion, which is our closest approach to the sun, we are actually making that closest approach in January. So that is really interesting, right? So in January, January 3rd, we are 147 million kilometers from the sun on average. We are actually at our closest approach to the sun in the beginning of January, in the middle of the winter in Minnesota. We know that that conceptually, that just, that doesn't seem like it makes sense, right? Because it's so cold. And yet I'm telling you that at perihelion, we are making our closest approach to the sun in January. But that, that's what's going on. And so it's pretty clear that it actually is not the distance to the sun that causes our seasons on the Earth. So if the primary thing that causes seasons is not the distance to the sun, then what is it? It turns out the answer is actually pretty simple. It's the tilt of Earth's axis. Now, right now we are tilted at a 23 and a half degree angle. That can change over time. We can go between a 22.1 and a 24.5 degree angle. It's a cycle that takes roughly 41,000 years. So we're kind of right in the middle of that right now. Um, and due to that 23 and a half degree tilt, that is what causes all of our weather and seasons. And the main reason for that is the fact that the sunlight is going to distribute itself differently depending on where you are on the Earth as we go around in our orbit. So we should talk about that for a little bit. All right, so now that we've established that seasons are caused by the tilt of Earth's axis, we are going to talk about two major things that change on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, due to that axial tilt and our revolution around the sun. And one of those things is the intensity of sunlight. Okay, so as you can see here, the intensity of sunlight is going to change based off of our axial tilt. So when the northern hemisphere is pointed towards the sun, the northern hemisphere is going to receive more direct sunlight. We're going to talk about the other effect later, but you might already be starting to guess what that might be as well. Okay, I think we should be able to see it a little bit more clearly here as well. So let's say we're in the northern hemisphere. So let's say in the northern hemisphere, the axial tilt is towards the sun. So the, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. We're going to receive more direct, more concentrated pockets of sunlight. So the intensity of sunlight is going to vary based off of where the axis of the Earth is pointing relative to the sun. So we can actually be further away from the sun, but if our axis, our northern pole, is tilted towards the sun, the northern pole is going to receive more direct sunlight. Okay, so if the intensity of sunlight is one thing that changes, you might have already started to guess that hand in hand with that, the amount of daylight hours is also going to change. So the duration that the sun is out, that's also something that's going to change. All right, so thinking about the amount of daylight hours, this is a solar graph over the course of a calendar year. A solar graph is a picture that's going to show us sunrise to sunset, a time lapse uh, over the course of every single day. So we're seeing sunrise and sunset for 365 days. And if you look down here, I'm going to predict that we're going to see our noontime sun in the winter 
right here because this is the this is the lowest it's going to be in the sky which means that the sun has the shortest path to travel which is going to be our shortest day and actually i would be right about that that's the, the noontime sun is going to be right about here for winter and the noontime sun for the summer is going to be at this peak right up here and that's our longest day because the sun has a much longer path to carve out in the summer so let's plot those something really interesting is going to happen though so I might assume that if I drew in a line up and down like this, this is going to be our noontime sun position every single day because it's at the top peak right here and it's at a peak right down here. But what actually happens, and I'm going to start to plot this out, is that the sun appears to rise and set at different times. And so these are our noontime sun positions over the course of the year and it starts to carve out this figure eight pattern. And this is a little bit of a side, but I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about why this is happening. Uh, we do call this the analemma. Okay, so we saw the analemma on the last page and that's showing the kind of little bit of a wonkiness with the position of the sun, the noontime sun at different times of the year. Now, the reason for that is the fact that our conception of the day is a little bit wrong. So we would expect the sun to rise in the same spot and just go a little bit higher over the course of a year, right? And that's because of the fact that we're more tilted towards the sun at different times of the year. But the fact that it appeared to move in that kind of uh, figure eight shape is a direct result of the sidereal versus the solar day. And so explaining that a little bit, if we look at figure one here, let's just say that this is today and I can look at the sun and it's at a certain spot. Now we would normally define a day as the amount of time it takes for the earth to rotate along its axis. But the trick is that as we rotate along the axis, we are also revolving around the sun. And so the way that it works out, if we look at figure two, figure two is after one complete rotation of Earth's axis. So that is what we would consider a sidereal day, one full rotation of the Earth's axis. The problem is, is that only takes 23 hours, 56 minutes. So the difference between position two, position three is about four minutes. Position three is when we're looking at the sun and it's in the same spot from our perspective as it was in day one. So position two is our rotation around the axis. Position three is where the sun is gonna be at the same spot the, the next day. All right, and to summarize, the sidereal day again is the amount of time that it takes for us to make one complete rotation. The solar day is that little bit of extra time that it takes for the sun to appear in the same spot in the sky, and that is our complete 24-hour solar day. So we have our sidereal day, our solar day. And that little bit of time every single day, that extra four minutes, that really can start to add up. So every year is actually 365.25 days. And what that means, well, that explains our leap year, right? So we add a day every four years to account for that extra discrepancy. Otherwise, our calendar wouldn't even add up. So if I go back to the analemma picture really quick again, I want to plot out the different times of the year in the Northern Hemisphere, the ones that are the most significant. So if we look at the summer solstice, summer solstice is between June 21st and June 23rd, and that is the longest day of the year, right? So, and that makes sense. If we look at the analemma, the sun is at its highest position in the sky. So the path that it's going to take to travel is quite a bit longer. It's our longest amount of daylight hours and our most intense sunlight. And the reason for that, again, is that even though we are further away from the sun during the summer solstice, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. The sun is directly overhead at the Tropic of Cancer, which is 23.5 degrees north latitude. And that makes sense because we have a 23 and a half degree tilt. That sunlight is going to directly line up at some point in the northern hemisphere during the longest day of the year, during the summer solstice. And so if I'm standing there at the Tropic of Cancer, the sun is directly overhead. But anywhere else north of that, and I'm gonna see the sun really high up in the sky, but not quite directly overhead. And that'll change based off of our latitude. If we look at the winter solstice, that's December 21st to December 23rd, six months later, that's the opposite. It's the shortest day of the year. And the sun is directly overhead at the Tropic of Capricorn. And so if I'm standing there in the Southern Hemisphere at 23 and a half degrees south latitude, that is the day that the sun will be directly overhead for me. But because the sun is so far in the south, the direct rays of sun, if I'm standing here in Farmington, Minnesota on that day, the sun is gonna appear really, really, really low in the sky. And if I'm at certain latitudes, even further north, 
the sun won't even go above the horizon. So we have some parts of the earth during the winter solstice where we're not we're going to receive 24 hours of nighttime. Not quite the case in Minnesota though, just very 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 short days. If we look at the spring equinox, that's March 21st to March 23rd, the day length is roughly the same. I'm going to actually throw up the fall equinox too, which again following that theme 6 months later, September 21st to September 23rd. The way that this works, the way these equinoxes work, equinox is Latin for equal light. So two times during the year, the sunlight will be equal among the hemispheres, which means that if I'm standing on the equator during those two days and I look straight up overhead, the sun will be there, right, at noon. So the sun is directly overhead at noon at the equator and the light is distributed evenly. And so we have roughly the same length of day and nighttime during the fall and the spring equinoxes. Hey, so we've made it to the end of the video. I kind of want to reflect on those Harvard graduates from the beginning of the video. We saw that they had that misconception, again, that the seasons are caused by the distance of the sun. In all of earth science, I've been a nurse science teacher for a while. I've been an astronomy teacher for a while. I think that this is the number one misconception that, that arises with students, with teachers, with anybody. Um, so if you go through this video and you think, well, yeah, that seems really obvious, that seems really simple, maybe take some time to reflect on it because I think that it's something that over time that you kind of can lose that knowledge and and then you go back to those those easy and comfortable misconceptions. So thank you for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. And remember, the seasons are caused by the tilt of Earth's axis.